thank the Lord. Amen. It's good to be in church this morning. And glad that you're here for Sunday school. And next Sunday we'll have a 10 o'clock service. It's Easter Sunday. And we're expecting a great time in the Lord. Amen. I believe somebody done turned that air conditioner on again this morning. Stick your head outside and it'll cool off quick. It's pretty cool out there. Thank the Lord. We want to pray today. Uh, I didn't know, I just found out that Carl Parker passed away this week. Sister D. Hart's first cousin. Amen. Been an attorney here in town for years and state representative at one time. So pray for their family. Ask the Lord to, to be with them and uh, Pamela Adcock needs prayer today. Shepard Smith, Will, and Liam Smith today. Cat Griffith, pray for Brother Don Griffith today. Floyd and Barbara Starr, Brother and Sister Bruns, and Joe, Joe Oaks needs prayer. If you have a need, why don't you just slip up your hand today? God knows every need that's in the house. Man, why don't we just stand this morning? Let's believe the Lord. Father, we love you. Thank you for another chance to be in the house of God. I pray that you'd bless us today. I pray that the hand of God would be upon us. I pray that the word would resonate in our lives, that someone would walk away from here today, change by the mighty power of your spirit. I pray that you'd do something miraculous today. We're giving you the glory and the praise that belongs to you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, touch everyone on our prayer list this morning. You heard each one of them's name. You're able today to do it exceedingly, abundantly above all that we should ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. We give you glory and praise this morning. Why don't some... Uh, you're not in a relationship today until you put it. I don't want to be left out. And I can't blame them for that. So I made it official today and my wife turned... We, celebrate 40 today. I started to say she turned 40, but Brother Matt turned 40 uh, Friday and two days after he was born, we got married. Amen. So it's been, been quite a weekend. So we're glad you're here today and I'm sure that 1145 group will get here before long. They'll come walking on in here, but we're glad that you came to 10 o'clock. Amen. I want my wife to come this morning and and tell us what's on her mind today. And she ought to have a lot on her mind after living with me for 40 years. Amen. He's half official because I haven't posted on Facebook. I haven't even been on Facebook today. But good morning and praise the Lord. Uh, Brother Matt preached um, a few services back and, uh, on how to get people's attention. And I can't necessarily say that they're cute and the men certainly aren't going to care one way or the other. But I took a fall in uh, September of last year. And uh, he said, if you want to get someone's attention, talk about what they're interested in, especially their children, their grandchildren, or just look down and say, cute shoes. If you were here, you remember that. And uh, my husband has not told me cute shoes today. Because this is the first time I've been in heels in six months, and I'll probably regret that too. But uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today with you and the expectation that I have, building my heart for what the Lord wants to do for the body of Christ in Port Natchez. And then not only we live, but we live again and, and grow. So... Uh, before I dive into my lesson. And I'm this happy ever after kind of person. You've probably noticed that. I'll laugh about anything or try to make it light. And sometimes things just aren't that way. Or we can try to find the brighter side of things, but um, you know, just find any reason to make it light. So in talking about the life of Joseph, I kind of want to get out of that. Now, we have a few more in the series to finish because I'm like, oh, God, give me hope. It's so wonderful to read the back of the book and what God does, but right in the middle of all of that, 
it's like it just all that pain and loss and suffering is like Jesus, can we go somewhere else? You know, can we just get out of this? We know what happens in the end and what the Lord does, but to talk about his pain and to kind of stir into some of ours, it's like, I just want to go someplace else. It's definitely out of my comfort zone. But um, to mention, we're still receiving candy for all those children that are going to need dental appointments after Easter. I like to drop some candy by before Sunday. Uh, this is our 75th year in Port Natchez, and uh, I've been here 26 and a half of those years, and I'm thankful for it. Uh, so we're going to do something about that in the summer. If you've got folks that want to go and you can somehow get uh, an address to us, we will make sure that they get that invite. There's a lot of folks in 26 years that I know that have visited or been here and, and moved away and so forth. So there's a lot to be had. And then there's folks that I probably don't ever even know unless you make me aware of that. And then um, you don't have to raise your hand, but just kind of an, uh, an acknowledgement of, you know, how many still look at your most wanted list that Brother Lee said, hey, write this down. If you didn't get one, if you need one, we have extra copies, but to keep us on task and know what we want to pray for and what the Lord wants to do, and then most excitedly, there's that tiny little space over to the left where you can write the date down and you can check it off as the Lord begins to, to work on those. And so I look at mine, don't lay them aside, press, press for this year to see those things done. So with that being said, I'm going to turn to the book of Psalms, to a very familiar scripture, uh, verse, uh, chapter 30, verse 5, and uh, there you go. We got it down. I didn't know if we'd be able to get it, but Brianna always works miracles at the last minute for me, and I'm so thankful. But it says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. And so uh, thank you for standing for the word of God. Uh, you may be seated. Um, in reading Chronicles and how they rediscovered the Bible because they had lost it. God's people had, well, I, we call it the Bible, but the word of God that was written, it always blows my mind whenever I go back and I read the Bible through about how they had lost it and they found it and they taught it all over again like it was brand new and they'd never been told. But how whenever they read it, all of the people stood for the reading of the word of God. Uh, so thank you for being reverent to the word. So let's look at this a little bit different, where it says, weeping may endure for a night. We could also read it this way. Grief may be difficult and painful, but great happiness or great pleasure comes in the morning. That's almost a state of being. It's a state of mind. Uh, it's a joy unspeakable, and it's full of glory. And how do we get that except that we have a hope in Jesus? Uh, Joseph, when I think about him, how he must have cried a lot because he had suffered so much from a young life. Whenever he lost his mother, he faced adversities. He faced struggles, and most of all, he, he faced great loss. Uh, and then he finds himself where I left off the last time, wandering in a place because he'd been sent for a task. But when he got there, his brothers were not there. I mean, what happens at the end of the road, or what's supposed to be the end of the road, when you actually get to where you're going because you've been told to go, only to find out that you've got to go a little further. And in today's world, we don't do this too often unless we really know the person, but he meets this man, and we believe that it was a di divine intervention because he's got to go a little f further to fulfill the dreams that God has given him, but he had to trust a stranger. If I'm lost in the state fair, I think the fair's going on, isn't it? Somebody said, are y'all going? I'm like, no. I've already done that for years. Uh, Somebody just out of the blue, there's nobody else there, and you're standing in the middle of nowhere, and you're telling me I have to go. I have to have a spirit of discernment to know if I'm really going to go or you tell me to go, and you're a stranger. And I'm a woman, and you're a man, but now we know that wasn't the case. However, Joseph was young, 
And all I could do was just, and maybe back then they trusted a little different, or maybe he just felt, and God just nudged him. But he found himself there. He had performed his task, but he's got to go a little further. So he finds himself between his dreams and what's going to be his betrayal. He finds himself between his dreams and God's divine purpose for his life. So there's kind of this little space, because when he got there, all he could do is just wait until he had further instruction. That, that could be considered like a pause or an interlude in our lives uh, when we play music. And there's that beautiful part, and we stop singing for a long time, and they play that. That's the beautiful part. But do we always feel like that's really beautiful? There is a pastor whose name is H. Becker Hicks, Jr. I looked him up. I wanted to see what he looked like. I wanted to see if he is still alive. He's a, uh, he, and he is. And so the little thing they give on the church website says he's in his 80s, and as of 2023, they, he, he had been the senior pastor of the Metropolitan Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., but they now list him as, I've never heard this word, not all of it anyway, senior servant emeritus. So he's still alive, and he's still taking part in this church in Washington, D.C., but he's also a published author. And he describes in his book entitled Preaching Through a Storm his difficulties in relations to taking a church that had been established. And I failed to catch or write down uh, the year he actually took this church, but it had been established since the Civil War. So you can imagine it had been there a really long time. He's 83, kind of do the math. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, he was attempting to transition the church and the congregation into a new century, and that can be difficult. Some storms are avoidable, and some storms are not avoidable. And if we look at avoidable storms in, in the Bible, one of them are noted in, is noted in uh, Acts chapter 27. When Paul writes it and he admonishes them not to get on the ship to go to Rome, he had already had a visitation from an angel, and he said, if you get on that ship, you will not die, but the ship will be destroyed, and all the cargo is going to be lost, but they did it anyway, and that was an avoidable storm, but that's where they found themselves, so once we're in an avoidable storm. Is it really any comfort to us to say hindsight's 50 50? Uh, 2020, I'm sorry, 2020. Uh, or to even know or acknowledge, hey, I could have avoided this. Often it just brings more sorrow. So, what we do, if it's not flight or fight, flight or fight or flight, we can only hope to survive the storm like they did in chapter 27. So Pastor Hicks writes in his book of one of his messages entitled, How Long is the Night? And I thought this was very appropriate to where we are. We have a slide. It, it's probably going to be bigger. A lot, uh, well, it's not as large as I thought it would be. So this is what he writes in his book, and this is what he says in his message. I know there is a better day a coming, but how long is the night? I know one day, every day will be Sunday, and every month, the month of May. But how long is the night? I know God's, God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. But how long is the night? Uh, and then the next one, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stay right here. Uh, I know that earth has no sorrow, that heaven cannot heal but how long is the night? I know there's a bright side somewhere, still, but I still need to know how long is the night? And I think we jumped one. I think we did. 
Yes, we did. Okay. Uh, the Lord must have known that I just, I needed to be humbled. Uh, okay. But he wants to know how long is the night. And somewhere you start seeing a glimmer of hope. God works in mysterious ways. All things work together for the good of those that love the Lord. But how long is my night? Jesus is near. Thank God. He's near to comfort and cheer just when I need him the most. But how long is the night? And earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. How long is the night? There's a bright side somewhere, I, but I still need to know how long is the night. Have we not all been there some way or another in our life with pain, with loss, with suffering, with maybe decisions we made or worse yet betrayal and decisions other people made that we had no control over? Storms, no matter how we try or don't try, they change us. It's when we are found between the dreams and the divine purpose that God has for our life. Joseph was in that middle part there, and sometimes we're in the middle. Storms shape us. They shape our influence in the world. When we look at Samuel, we know that the Bible tells us that he found favor with God, but he found favor with all men, too. So there's a center of influence we have. And, and I see Sister Mary just like right here in front of me, and she still has a little one, and you have little ones, and you're their influence. You know, uh, brother, uh, President Bush said, uh, preach, and I'm saying this loosely. It's not a quote. And, and use words when necessary. They watch us. So there's an influence there, and we have to have favor. And whenever I began to pray to the Lord that I would be able to keep my influence over some people in my life, that I wouldn't be able to lose that, I prayed that, and I, and I feel like the Lord heard my petition. But as I continued and still continue to pray that prayer, there was another awareness in my life that I can't have that influence if I don't have favor with him. If I don't influence him before the throne, how am I supposed to have con that godly influence that continues? So when we have our storms, they influence us and they teach us things. Uh, my message to those that I influence is today is very different from what I would have attempted to do. I probably didn't have any influence when I got married. I was 19. It's different after each storm, too. We're supposed to learn a little bit, hopefully. Um, there's an urgency, there's an expectation, there are lessons and there are warnings in the storms, or all of the above when we share and try to help others like Paul did. And sometimes we listen, and sometimes we don't. And when we don't, thank the Lord that we can get back on track. It's not the end of the road. We're not done yet. Thank God for the cross. Thank him for his mercy. Thank him for his grace, his forgiveness, his salvation, his deliverance, his victory. When we obey him, when we get back. Because obedience is the greatest of all of those. So when we were in South Carolina, my husband, had wit he had wisdom beyond his years. I think we went, I was 22, and you might have been 27. And, um, and so he led the church as their very young pastor. And it didn't take me long to realize, you know, we were learning each other for a long time. We had three children pretty early in our marriage, but it's amazing how when you look back after 40 years, it's like, you know, we didn't talk to each other. And he's mentioned this recently about how neither one of us felt to go to South Carolina, but we wanted to be obedient and we didn't want to be selfish people. You know, do I want to go? Do I want to suffer? I don't, I'm not wanting to come here because it's not an easy path. We didn't, I'm his wife, I'm his helpmate, so I want to follow him. And he doesn't say, I don't, what do you think about it? We didn't talk about it like that. We followed our elders. Our elders said, hey, there's a need. And we were like, we'll feel that need. Now, God blessed. But talk about our boot camp, you know. And so uh, we went there. And looking back, I was thinking about that within the last year. It's like, you know, we really, if you think about it, Ashley was, Derek was not born. We'd been married two years. We, and we didn't date very long. We didn't know each other. 
Not really. Not to make big decisions and, and me tell him because I'm following him and I'm his helpmate. I just don't feel this. I don't think this is right. You know, but sometimes we deviate. Anyway, so that's what we did, and we found ourselves there, and I always found his leadership to be accurate then as a pastor in spiritual authority. And now, because another thing you do when you're young is you're passionate about everything you do, including arguing. And I'm a woman, so I'm confessing on my 40th wedding anniversary that I like to be right. We all like to be right. And I guess when I was 19, 20 years old, I wanted my way whether I was right or not because I thought I was right. And um, he has said, when I know I'm right, I just shut up. And he also says, when I know I'm wrong, I just shut up. So what is it? You know, it's, I'm just going to be quiet. So I don't know if I'm right or not because he shuts up. <laughs> and after 40 years, that doesn't happen much either. Um, and I just had to be right. Especially in spiritual matters, I would think it's this way. And he'd say, no, it's that way. And, and I never proved him wrong. And that's really a comfort, and that's a blessing. Uh, the problem in pastoring when you're 25, 26, 27 is you lack experience, or they think you lack experience. You know, you have a head full of hair. It's not gray. Uh, your babies are little. You're not through having a, a, a young family. And so all they could see is his youthfulness through all of that. They couldn't see that maybe whenever he was, took his first job at seven and eight years old, that he had some experience, or that he just listened to God. And this is not plug, you, plug my past or my husband day because I've been married 40 years. It's just the truth. And so there was that impression. And so they didn't listen. And we all found ourselves in a storm. The man I knew then and the man I know now, he just wasn't wrong in the matter of spiritual affairs. So storms... Speaking of storms, we live on the Gulf, and we are all extremely familiar in a very, very painful way uh, what storms can do to us personally and in our area. And so there are some names that I doubt anyone in here will ever name their children or their pets. Things like Rita, Umberto, Ike. Harvey, Laura, or Delta? Katrina. Katrina. Well, uh, were you affected by Katrina? Yeah. yeah. Well, Katrina came here. The, the evacuees came here only to have to run for their lives because Rita was coming. Randy and Stephanie came this way. They lost absolutely everything. We, be, we went into New Orleans. And it was unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. So Harvey is not necessarily what did the most damage to everybody in here. Because Brother Don and Sister Vicki and Sister Amelia and, and on and on, Ike hit them really, really hard. Every bit as hard as Harvey did. And um, I think when Harvey hit, there were 20-something families in this church personally affected in some way or another because you know a storm may blow through and take your roof off but the water gets everybody and an Ike water got brother and sister Griffith um, Harvey is the second costliest storm in the US history racking up a whopping 125 billion dollars worth of damage which makes it the costliest storm in Texas history. What I looked up, I read from here. They make the, the top in three categories as being the most prolific rainfall event associated with the tropical cyclone, with a tropical cyclone in the U.S. history, with the peak rainfall total of, and we all know this, over 60 inches. And they specifically say, where you can read this everywhere, near Nederland, Texas. That's us, near Nederland. Setting the national record for the largest rainfall total measured in connection to a tropical cyclone. It di displaced 1.8 million people, 
how many people are sitting on these pews this morning that make up a part of that 1.8 million people. Uh, we, were, we were those people. Uh, in Houston alone, more than 60,000 residents had to be rescued. 16,930 homes were destroyed. And 290,063 homes were damaged. We're those people. We all sit here, whether it was Ike or Umberto or Harvey or Delta or Laura or Rita, and some of us was more than once. Some of us here were more than once. The, the Brunses lost their home completely during Rita. And then they moved up the road a little bit and they flooded in Harvey. And no sooner had they got their floors back in, they flooded up by a small amount again. And the same history is, is with the beat airs in Orangefield when that happened. And they made the national news with their bird. They had to be evacuated from the second floor. These are our stories. These are your stories. Whatever's in your heart, just like these natural storms, they're your stories. They're your storms. Whether they be avoidable or unavoidable, it brings untold damages to our lives. Storm-taught lessons can help others from an avoidable situation. My husband has always said, I let, he said, I observe people, and I let their, be, their lessons be my lessons. And he said that early. He said that young. And so I didn't really know how to verbally articulate that. His lessons are personal, and they're outward also. All of my lessons came from, most all of my lessons before I was an adult came from within inside my home. Kind of like the what not to do sort of stuff. So he would say, I let that lesson be my lesson, so I would not repeat that in my life. But for me, looking from the inside, inside, you know, because I wasn't looking outside, there is a, there is a naive part of us. And Revelation comes for everybody at a different time in their life. For me, I must have been 11. I remember feeling like my childhood was over at eight years old whenever I had to become the little mom because of an incident that happened. But I don't think the full awareness hit me, but it hit my brother sooner. And little boys need their moms. We all need our moms and dads. Little boys need a good, positive female influence in their life. My brother learned it much earlier than I did. But there is a revelation that comes in your life, and because we were so isolated, I wouldn't say sheltered, but isolated, it came for me later when I realized that not everybody lives exactly like me. And if you're an only child, it takes you a while to figure that out too, because it's just, it's just you, where the rubber meets the road. And so I remember looking around and finally being able to visit some of my friends and one of my friends had eight other brothers and sisters, and I loved that house. Busy and messy and always home-cooked food because you weren't going to go out and buy anything, you know, and baby dolls when you're still 12 and 13 years old. And then you think, my innocence is over. It's been ruined because not everybody lives like this. But thank God he has a purpose. So mine was I observed what was going on in the home. And whatever was happening there, whatever they, however they were doing it, that made us sad and everything disrupted, then I was just going to do the opposite. Because the opposite from sad is happy. So if you do it this way, one of these days when I grow up and I get my choice, I'm going to do it this way and then I'll be happy. Because even in my teenage years, I realized whenever I was young, I didn't have a choice to live Adults made the choices for me. So whenever I got grown, I would not make the choice to live that way. And thank God he heard my prayer and knew that was the desires of my heart. So that's the way I looked at it. Storm warnings are meant to protect our hearts and minds from utter devastation. Because a car can hydroplane with just three quarters of an inch of water. 
A human being can be knocked off their feet with just 12 inches of moving water, and a car can take as, all, as little as 12 inches of water to move. And potentially, not, not if, if you survive it, you know, it's disrupted your life. But if you don't, I mean, it's disastrous. It's tragic. We can benefit from the shared counsels of others to be the shelter from our storm. We've already said a couple of times those he uses are those he bruises. I say it this way. If we go through something, you can't let it go to waste. You know, you've, you've got to share it. What, what is it for? But a Holocaust survivor by the name of Ellie Weasel said it this way, not to transmit an experience is to betray it. And I thought that was great. And what better way than somebody that has been through so much that I've never gone through or been able to understand. So there is a term in the insurance industry called back to steel and stone. I don't know if you've ever heard that or not, uh, but a lot of you understand exactly what it means. It, and it, it is what it sounds like. Whenever there is so much devastation and destruction to your home because of a storm, sometimes the only thing you're going to get it down to is the foundation. Back to the steel, back to the stone. You have to start all over with everything else. And sometimes it doesn't hurt for us to go back to our foundation and remember what we're doing and why we're doing it, what we're here for. Uh, you know what it is for your house to be gutted and go back down to the foundation, back to the sheer guts. Some here we've lost entire homes to the things that are unavoidable. And as painful as it is, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And that brings little comfort except to know that God's got us. Because doesn't it sound cliche when you're there and I'm not, and I'm saying, God, it, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. You see somebody that maybe in your mind you thought has committed so much sinful or criminal, and here I am, I'm trying to do everything I know to do. I remember my first experience with God, I've done everything I know to do, was about 16 or 17 years old. God, I've done this, and I've done this, and I've tried. I want to be good. I want to be right. And, and good in my life for so many years seemed to be more paramount than recognizing I had to be godly first. I wanted to be good, but how about I be godly and then I be good? And so I'm like, but God, I did this, and... And, and it was supposed to work because it's right. And I did this, and I've done all I knew to do. And I was broken, and I was crying. And I said, just, I don't know what else to do. Tell me what to do, and I'll do it. And it's like I heard his spirit just say to me, you didn't give it to me. You didn't try me. Give it to me. And, you know, I did. I'm like, well, I'm going to take my hands off of it. And I did. And it worked. But for the others, like a storm, Sometimes it shows up disguised with blue tarps, roll-off bins, and endless trash bags that have to be sent to the road with all of our memories. Then I remember Joseph and the 70 souls that entered into Egypt during the famine because God had a plan. And when they came out, they were more than a million strong. I want to be more than a million strong. And I want to be more than a million angels strong because we entertain angels unaware pain is not convenient and I don't ever want to let my worship become convenient because then I'm complacent and God doesn't necessarily move in those waters the deep calls the deep that's where all the good stuff is but who really wants to go there you know you can't touch bottom you have to trust there's a lot to get there um, those that are invested they stayed they rebuilt. Others, they had to leave. Others just left. You know, you say a storm, you're going to run from something. Brush fires, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, landslides, avalanches. It's everywhere. I mean, you can run from this, but you're going to run from something else too. Uh, I say, you know, we say the grass is always greener on the other side. I say, fertilize your own grass. You know, you, right now is this time that you get out and you see everybody pushing their little things because they're out there. Just stay, you know. Hurricanes, they hit and they hurt, but nothing like COVID did. I mean, yes, 
the tangible and the, the agony of, but COVID hit in a different agonizing way and in a spiritual way. Once again, my husband has said, when the church is doing good, it's my church. And when it's bad, we want to give it back to him. But what if it's his church all the time? Because truthfully, it is. And he also says that his house should be called a house of prayer. What if we made a mental note before leaving today that I am part of the body of Christ? I am the church. What will you, Jesus, do with the church? I can come to church. I can show up. I can sing. I can pray. I can come to prayer meeting. But what is it that you want me to do? Because the Bible said that Abraham was a friend of God because he kept his charge. Now, we know that we're supposed to be obedient to the word of God. But then there's things that he's going to ask of you that he doesn't ask of me. And so, and me, that he did. And then that's obedience because if he says, go invite that person to church. Or one particular time, and I do not have time for this story. I, just, I, I came off the platform. I'd never, I'd never run around church in my life. And I felt like I was just on fire because I was quenching the spirit. And God said, run. And I'm like, I can't run. I'm a woman in a dress and heels. I can't. And I was much younger. And so it was like this veil just opened up to me. And I could see people, but they, it just, it was like a screen that you describe whenever you come down and you can just see some things. And, and I felt like the Lord was showing me some things here and here and not too far from where Brother and Sister Smith are sitting. And so as I trucked around, God said, go tell that man this. I'm like, I can't do that. I'm a woman. One day I may share that whole story before everybody. I've shared it with some. I didn't do it. Months went by. It would have changed his life. And I would have been obedient. Um, and he called me out because he felt the same thing I did. And I missed it. So what will you do with me, God? Whether I'm broken or going through a storm or not. Because when I'm not in a storm, I'm doing pretty good. Um, back to the foundation of my experience. Back to the newness. Back to the steel and stone. Even when it hurts. Joel said to rend your hearts, not your garments. Forcibly separate your heart from the world. Not your tangible things. So what do we do when we try to give God our best effort? Like we know Job did whenever he said, the Lord gives and he takes away, but blessed be your name. But we're still in pain and we're still in agony. We still find ourselves in a loss. Matthew 12 and 20 tells us, God will not extinguish, extinguish a flickering candle or break a, an already crushed reed. Jesus has the ability to calm the storm or calm the person in the storm. Often the latter seems to be his preferred course of action. His presence is better than the presence of the storm. Wherever you are, let's just say it's time for a turnaround. If the economy is bad and it's getting worse, money doesn't stretch as far, you need a new job, you'd like more money, you're a single parent, you've lost your job, you've suffered loss of a loved one, you've gone through a divorce, or you're just experiencing those emotions of anger, bitterness, depression, and hurt, and the question why. Um, Jacob wrestled with God at Bethel. He called it Bethel, the house of God, because that's where he had his experience. But it's also been called El Bethel. So not only the house of God, but the God of the house. Is he the God of your house? Is he the God of my house? So how long is the night? I don't know. But I know God is faithful that promised. He doesn't extinguish our fire, and he does not crush or destroy us when we're already broken. Because crushed means to squeeze or to force by pressure as to destroy you. God doesn't want to destroy us. He wants to mold us. He puts us on that wheel. We may be tried by fire, but he does not desire to crush us. He doesn't want to crush our pain, our loss, our needs, our health, our marriage, 
our dreams because just because we're somewhere in between our dreams and our purpose. God bless you this morning.
into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Hallelujah. Why don't we do that right now, church? Why don't we bless the name of the Lord? Praise God. Praise God. Lord, we worship you. We exalt you. We magnify you. King of kings and Lord of lords, you're worthy of our highest praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. It feels wonderful in this house this morning. Man, I believe the Lord has something very special in store for us. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Good to see everybody today. Amen. Very special day today. Brother and Sister Lee celebrating their 40th anniversary. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Invested interest in their anniversary because if they wouldn't have said I do to one another 40 years ago, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to say I do. So I celebrate them and their their 40th anniversary. Amen. Love, brother and sister Lee, so very grateful for them. We have some prayer requests we want to bind together again. I know we prayed this morning, but we want to, we've got a few more folks in here today, we want to pray for these needs, bring them to the Lord today. We want to continue to pray for Pamela Adcock, pray that the Lord would touch her body. Man, she's been through a lot, and uh, God is a healer, and we absolutely believe that today. Pray that the Lord would touch Sister Adcock, Shepherd Smith, in need of a touch. Uh, Will and Liam Smith want to pray for them. Pray the Lord would touch them. Cat Griffith, Brother Don want to lift him up in prayer this morning. Floyd and Barbara Starr, and Brother and Sister Bruns continue to pray for them. And Joe Oates is in need of uh, prayer this morning, need of a touch. If you have a need in your life, if you'll signify by the uplifted hand, needs all over this house. Let's stand and go before the Lord together in His presence. Lord Jesus, we love you. Once again, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to come into your presence, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would move in a mighty way in this house. Lord, come inhabit our praises today, Lord, as we enter into your gates with thanksgiving. Lord, as we come before you with songs of praise, Lord, come inhabit our praises today. God, come and move in the miraculous in this place, Lord. Touch hearts and lives through the moving of the Holy Ghost, mighty God. Move with liberty in this house. Lord, encourage, Lord, those in need of encouragement today. Direct those in need of direction today. Lord, we know that you're a healer of the body, Lord, and it's by your stripes we're healed, and we ask that you would do that today. Heal those in need of healing today in their body. Lord, every need that's represented, the spoken and the unspoken, we know that you're able to supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory, mighty God. We thank you for what you've done and for what you're doing and for what you're going to do, mighty God. We give you the praise and the honor and in the glory. Could you give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now? Lord, we thank you for the work that you're doing. Lord, we exalt you and we magnify you. Lord, let us leave change today by the moving of your spirit. Lord, minister to us through your word here today, mighty God. Lord, every deed that's represented, we call upon the name that is most high in the name of Jesus today. Lord, touch, heal, deliver, and set free. And we pray all these things in the wonderful name above every name. The whole church said, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Why don't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Come on, why don't you just invite the Lord to inhabit our praise here today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come and move. Come and dwell in this house. Move in the miraculous today. Lord, we magnify you and we exalt you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's continue to magnify the Lord.
God, and he alone is worthy of our praise. Glory to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We magnify you in this sanctuary today, oh God. Lord, we thank you for this season of worship, God, that we're entering into, mighty God. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship and to magnify you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Glory to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. It feels so wonderful in this house this morning. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God, praise God. Had a new face in Sunday school this morning. 
couple weeks ago, we had Skyler join the youth group, and we had Elena this morning join the youth group. So excited she was back there. I'd heard, I'd heard a rumor that she, she turned, she turned old enough to be back there with us, twelve, and and uh, she popped in this morning, was really excited, all smiles. So so happy to see her back there. Amen. A wonderful time with the young people this morning. Praise God. Give you an opportunity to give. Ushers would come. Amen. Continuing our worship and giving. Amen. It's, it's definitely an intricate part of what we do. Amen. We trust the Lord that when we pray, we lift our hands, that He hears our prayers, that He receives our worship. But we're going to pray that the Lord would bless our giving financially. And, and I believe that He will today. It's blessed in Jesus' name. Give such as you're able. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord.
of our heart, all of our might, everything that we've got. Let's give it to Him today. You can never praise Him enough. You can never thank Him enough. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's good to have everyone here today. Good to see Sister Ruth. We've been missing her. So glad that she is able to make it today. And good to have Brother Michael back. Amen. 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 I tell you what, about every year he does it at this time of the year, works that shutdown or turnaround. I don't know the difference. Amen. I just know they're working. And when the ox is in the ditch, you got to get them out. But it never fails. He may be three months into it. But whenever it's over, he walks right back in here like he's been here all along. <laughs> and something to be said. Amen. Amen. Appreciate Brother Michael today. And so thankful for him and glad he's got a little break. Brother Brian's got a little break. And, and next Sunday's Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Next Sunday's Resurrection Sunday. And we need candy brought in, candy rain, and gonna be an old fashioned egg hunt. Plastic eggs, no real eggs. My son and a few more corporates a few years ago stopped us from bringing real eggs out here. <laughs> they got to throwing them eggs at each other, and they got them on Brother Pellerin's car, and he had a fit. And, amen. I kind of thought it was funny myself, but I wasn't going to tell him that. <laughs> I wasn't the one that had to wash it. But We went to plastic eggs, and I said, don't throw the plastic eggs. They'll be more damaging than what the real eggs were. So we knew plastic eggs now. And I hope it's not too painful on them chickens out there. going to lay them plastic eggs next Sunday. <laughs> That just seems a little painful to me. But we're going to have a great time. We really are. We're going to have a great time next Sunday. Thank the Lord. In the book of Revelations, I know today's Palm Sunday. I get it. I've got to fill a holiday to preach about a holiday. Or, but we know it's Palm Sunday that the entrance of our Lord and Savior for the Last Supper. And we reference that. But I just feel to, to go a little bit different today. Amen. Next Sunday is Resurrection. Sunday we'll be talking about His resurrection. Amen. And that's what the whole day is centered about. You thought where you would be today if Jesus Christ had not been born and died and resurrected again for you and I. We would be a men most miserable today. So glad we had a Savior that came. But I want to go to Revelations, the, the fifth chapter in the ninth verse. It says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and has redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and has made us unto our own God, kings and priests. We shall reign on earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And if the Lord had helped me for a little while this morning, I want to talk about living worthy of his dying Amen. living 
worthy of his dying. And his words blessed today in Jesus' name. So glad you're in church this morning. Amen. So thankful that you're in the house of the Lord. Living worthy of his dying. And I just read it in Revelations. Redeemed us. Amen. Thank God that Jesus came. And he was the supreme sacrifice for all the sins of the world. When I think about what Jesus did for us, and sometimes we say, when I think about what He did for me, and everyone in here could say, when I think about what He did for me, because He did it for all of us. Does it matter if you like some people or if you don't like them? The Bible didn't say that you had to like everybody. It just said you got to love everybody. There's things about people's ways I don't like, and there's things about my ways that they don't like, but that don't make them a bad person. It don't make me a bad person. It's just we've got our different tics about us. We've got our different ways about us. And everybody has a way of, of doing certain things. And if you don't believe that's true, put two families in one home and you got war. Because a, a woman wants to run her kitchen the way she wants to run it. And she don't want no daughter, and she especially don't want no daughter-in-law in her kitchen trying to tell her how to run her kitchen. And let's leave it at that. Because it don't work with two families in a house. It just never has. But, but I've come to tell you that no matter what our, our problems are, our issues are, me and my wife was talking about issues and people that's got issues, and I guess Brother Lacombe preaching what he did here made us more aware of issues. And one of the most powerful words that I've heard in a, quite a long time. And, and no matter what our issues, and I looked at her yesterday in jest, and I said, aren't you thankful that all them other people's got issues and we don't have any? I mean, we're just, we're free of all of that. And truth be known, we got more than anybody. Amen. Or we got our fair share of issues and but when I think about Jesus giving himself as a ransom for us for God so loved the world that he gave they didn't so much in one sense as kill him he gave his life he was willing to die. A lot of people get all this stuff. You know, he didn't, when they took him to the cross, or oh, they killed him, but when they took him to the cross, he didn't go kicking and screaming saying, I don't want to be crucified. He gave himself in Titus 2 and 14. It said, who gave himself for us that he might what? Redeem us. Everybody say, redeem us from all iniquity. I'm glad that he gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity. Guess who us is? That's us. Boy, that makes a lot of sense. That's deep this morning, isn't it? For us. And purified unto himself a peculiar people. Zealous of good works. I'm peculiar. My grandma, she was an odd duck herself, but she'd meet somebody that she didn't quite g with. She said, mm, they're peculiar. What she's saying is that's a strange old duck right there. Peculiar. Strange. Have you ever noticed how strange that person is and how peculiar well they probably think you're strange and and they probably think that you're peculiar too and because everybody has got their own little world that they live in and and some of them wake up in a different world every day zoe did something funny at brother matt's party the other night and she sung 
happy birthday to him and she looked around and then she throwed her hands out like a choir director and she started singing happy birthday to you. Strange little girl. And I looked at Brother Tom and I said she wakes up in a different world every day. And some would probably say she's strange, but she's not strange to her. It's just the way she is, full of life and happy and lives and dances to her own beat of her own drum. And if it don't, she don't probably don't care if it bothers you or not. It certainly don't bother her. And, and she wasn't bothered by anybody in there that looked at her and probably thought she's a peculiar little girl. Well, I got news for him. I saw him in the world that's way more peculiar with that. I saw him with part of their hair pink and part of it green and one side of their head shaved and, and a ring in their nose. And Have you ever wondered how they blow their nose and keep that stuff off of that nose ring? I saw a girl, she was waiting on me the other day, and she had a round thing. I thought they only put that in cattle. But she had a round thing in her nose, and I thought, how do they blow their nose and keep all that stuff off of that? And, and I'm going to ask one sometime, how do you keep that clean if you get a runny nose or something? I'm just stuff I wonder, and people's going to leave here and they say, he's a very peculiar pastor. <laughs> but I wonder about them things, so... Doing that kind of stuff's not near as peculiar as the way some people dress and the way some people act and the way some people look. Thank God they're not in bar rooms and doing things that they're not supposed to. Just in there directing a choir at the table, singing happy birthday to their daddy. And I didn't think it was that peculiar, but she dances to her own beat of her own drum. And, and we thank God for it every day because she's ours. Amen, and we thank God for it. And we got together as the two families that both forty on his fortieth Friday night, and it was loud. And Brother Tom said, "Some of these grandkids in here are yours too," and I'm very much aware of that. But they got more than we do. Loud. I told Matt this morning. I said, "You know, when you don't know it today, but when you get older, that loud gets on your nerves." My grandma, my aunt used to say, y'all on my nerves, go to the yard. You can't get a kid in the yard today. You know, they over there on their iPads playing video games when they're not screaming and hollering, running around and just having a good time. Well, you can't say that to them. They're kids. They're just being children. Living worthy of his dying. He thought that we was worthy Think about that this week. Jesus thought that we was worthy of his dying. So when I think about the way I live, I want to live worthy of his dying. He thought I was worthy. I want to live worthy of his dying. There's no way Mel Brooks tried to portray it years ago on the movie screen. The crucifixion of Jesus. Hollywood cannot portray it. There's no way that you can do it justice when you think about just what Jesus went through. At Calvary. I've watched a lot of people die. And it's a part of ministry that, that I don't look forward to. And I've been in the room when they've unplugged a many a person. I was in the room with Bonnie when they unplugged Brother Scott. And it is a time in my life that is forever etched in my brain that I will never get out. I was in the room with Brother Michael and Sister Alicia, some of their family, when that 14-year-old boy got shot in the rib with an unloaded pellet gun. 
and there was a pellet lodged in it. It went into his lung and it punctured his lung and it collapsed and he died. They declared him brain dead and I was in there that day whenever they unplugged him. I was in there with Sister Loretta's daughter-in-law whenever they unplugged her. I've seen a lot of people die. I was in the emergency room one day when a lady come out of the emergency room and they was taking her to the ICU unit and she began to scream and holler, you pray, Brother Lee, I'm fixing to die. I feel it coming, I'm fixing to die. And all you can do is try to comfort and even when you're trying to comfort, words fail. I've watched them leave this world screaming. I don't want to die. We had an elderly lady in this church years ago that said, whatever you do, you keep me alive. And they did everything within their means to keep her alive. And I finally got the doctor and went to the daughter in the waiting room and explained to this daughter, there's nothing more they can do to keep your 86-year-old mama alive. Because it's appointed that a man wants to die. And that's something we're all going to face one day. Isn't that encouraging this morning? But as you get older, you begin to think about that. The sun's going to set somewhere out there. I'm 40 years, and I thought this morning, 10 more years, I'll be married 50 years. That would put me at 75 years of age. And I know if you're 75, you're thinking, that's not old. And I hope I feel that way when I get 75. And I hope I'm able to get around as good as I can right now when I'm 75. But then you tack on 85 more years to it. And if you live to be in your 90s, that's getting right on up there. And don't think that people at that age don't get up every day and wonder, is this going to be the last day that I open my eyes and watch the sunrise and watch the sunset? He thought it was worth dying. For a sin sick world. When I think about the way I live and what I do for Christ, I want to live a life that's worthy of His dying. What I sacrifice, what I do. I strive every day for the spirit of excellence. I want to have a spirit of excellence in my community. I want a good name. A good name is greater than any riches you can ever have. I strive to have a good name because it's a spirit of excellence. I strive for a spirit of excellence in my home. And I missed the boat at times. Brother G.A. Mangan said one time, it takes two to fight. It takes two to argue. And he said, I learned with Sister Mangan early in life, if I shut up, it takes two. And he said, I just learned when to clam up. Like an old turtle, just stick your head in your shell and just let it. You can thump me. Amen. Sister Mary, am I preaching to you this morning? I'm surprised Brother Brian ain't up shouting. I think he's scared too. You can try everything in the world, but it takes two. That's right. You ever got an old turtle and want him to stick his head out and just thump that shell? He won't do it for nothing. I even got a screwdriver one time, tried to open it, couldn't open it. I said, I'm going to get your head out of there if it's the last thing I do. I want to look at you. I thump that turtle, come on, stick that head out of that shell takes two and I learned it it takes two when I'm right I know when to shut up and when I'm wrong 
I still know when to shut up. I read that scripture one time. It said to be quiet. So I've learned to be quiet. And then it's up to you to be able to discern if I'm right or if I'm wrong. Because I quote my good friend, Brother Boyd, be there as long as I think I'm right in my own mind. That's all that matters. I asked him one time, I said, well, Brother B, the Bible said that a fool is right in his own mind. He said, well, we ain't going to talk about that. <laughs> We're going to leave the Bible out of this. <laughs> and I would say that's the way a lot of Americans are. But I do have the ability that when I'm wrong, I can say I'm wrong. Because I want to live worthy Amen. of his dying. That's why I'm as dogmatic over things as I am. My cousin Donna probably watched this sometime this week. She asked me a few months ago why I got loud when I preached. I said, because I like to scream. I just like to holler sometime. And she said, oh, I see. They used to come in during the summer at times and, and, and they always liked to come in and they wanted me there because I'd, I'd entertain them. I'd make them laugh. But she said, y'all, it always seemed to be in one of them revival meetings. That's back when you went six, seven nights a week. And then they'd get mad at me because I'd come in at 10, 11 o'clock at night and I'd fry a hamburger. Well, you got to eat a hamburger before you go to bed at night. And her mom would get upset. He's in there messing that kitchen up. And I'd make sure I'd leave things out just to make her mad. And Donna said, we'd wait and wait and we'd finally go to bed because we wanted to visit with you so bad. She said, why did you have to go to church all the time? Because it was living... Worthy of his dying. Something got a hold of me. And it wouldn't let me go. Jesus got into my heart. He got in my soul. And he just wouldn't turn me loose. There's things that, that I do and things that I shun away from that... that Brother Ricky stopped me on the way out Wednesday night. He said, my little grandson had a little league baseball game and said his daddy just loves baseball and said, I want Ryder to play it till he's 12. And then if he wants to play basketball, but I at least want him to play baseball till he's 12. And he said, I like to go watch him play that baseball game. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's something that grandson won't forget as long as he lives with his granddad being out there watching him play Little League Baseball. And I said, you know, back when I was a child, if, if you did that, you was going to go to hell. And I wanted to play football. And I could see the cheerleaders over on the sideline saying two bits, four bits, six bits a dollar, all for Danny Boy stand up and holler. And they did holler, get away from me, boy. <laughs> Amen. We all had dreams. We had ambitions. And I went to my pastor and said, I want to play some football. I want to knock some knots on some heads out there on that football. Oh, you can't do that. And, and, and from a young teenager standpoint, when his grandson was able to go and join the band and be in the marching band and go to the games and play at the games, yet I couldn't play football. So I said, inconsistent. And I just began to take notes for years. I said, now if they can go play the band, march in the band, football games, I ought to be able to knock some knots on some heads because I loved football back then. Love them cheerleaders more, but I love football. 
And I wanted to impress them cheerleaders. I wanted to get me one for a girlfriend. Didn't say I wanted to marry. I just wanted to get one for a girlfriend. And, and I, I, I looked back. I gathered all that. And, and I sat under Brother Karn in third, fourth, and fifth grade. And Donnie Copeland then went to old Brother Karn, this Brother Tenny's father-in-law. And, and they wanted to play Little League Baseball. And, and they went and sat down with Brother Karn and said, Brother Karn, we can play Baseball, we love to play baseball. And Brother Karn sat there. He was such a kind, gentle man. He said, well, I don't see anything wrong with boys getting out there and chasing a baseball. It's good for you to keep you out of trouble with the law. And, and I thought, I've looked back. He was years ahead of his own self. This was back in the 60s. Then I moved to Winsboro, and the only thing that wasn't a sin was eating apple pie and getting pregnant and having babies. Well, you ain't going to forget today. What well, is the truth? And <laughs> we, we had enough kids being born in that church all the time. And, and mercy sakes alive. Some of them had 10 or 12 kids. I had three, and I'd be in the grave today, I think, if I'd have had one or two more. Brother Ricky just stopped me, and he said, Ryder had a game. I said, well, nothing wrong with that. He's only going to be young one time. And you got to make memories. You got to make memories. And I look back over the years and things that could have saved people. Might would have been that if, if, if instead of being so condemning and trying to put people in hell over every little old thing, is trying to save people. So that ain't cost you nothing today. Through all the inconsistencies I began to see growing up. One of the men that taught the adult lesson in, in Sunday school of all things. He was against shake, rattle, rock and roll. But he loved country and western music. Brother Lacombe spelled it out pretty good. A blind here would lend on my mind. They sung at that old dead boy's funeral and went none. Plugged the jukebox that he ain't lying with lending on his mind, he's dead. And I begin to think country music's okay, but rock and roll music's not okay. And every Sunday in Sunday school, we'd hear about rock and roll music, but those rednecks in there with their boots on, they still was listening to Randy Travis back then. You're a cheating heart. We'll tell on you. Well, it will. And there's a message somewhere in that song, your cheating heart will tell on you. We cheat on God a lot. But where it brought me to is living worthy of his death. Come on. I don't look at the grandson that was a good friend of mine that got to play in the marching band. I'm going to live a life worthy of his dying. I don't come to church and look at other people's inconsistencies. I'm going to live a life that's worthy of his dying. When I think of his goodness and what he's done for me, it makes me want to shout, shout, shout. What has he done for me? He gave his life as a ransom for you and I. It makes me want to shout. He blesses me beyond measure. He supplies my every need. I've never seen his righteous forsaken or the seed begging for bread. I've been young, I'm old and older and going to get older by the grace of God. But I've still never seen his seed forsaken or the righteous begging for bread. He ain't done me nothing but good. I've come to testify to you today. I want to live worthy of Jesus' death. 
He so loved that he gave. He gave himself for us. Amen. Willing. Nobody had a rope on him dragging him to the cross. He didn't have his heels dug in. I can't go to the cross. He was willing. He laid himself on that old tree like a, a lamb. As humble as humble could be. He just laid himself there. So on your worst day of your life, if you wake up this week and feel like that you can't function anymore and you can't make it on the worst day of your life, why don't you go back to Calvary and remember what Jesus did for you? Think about that. When I wake up And things of life faces me. I think about what Jesus did at Calvary. And I get up and say, I'm living worthy of your dying. Amen. I told some preachers on that boat the other day, they got off on some stuff. And I said, I tell you what, anybody you don't want, send them to Port Natchez, we'll take them. Because I want to live worthy of his dying. I don't want to just nitpick people and look at people's weaknesses and condemn them over their little weaknesses because we've all got our weaknesses. We've all got our ways. We've got our shortcomings. We've got them little things about us. They sung a little song in Sunday school, and I didn't like that song very much. But they'd make us sing it. Everybody stand up. We'd stand up. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Well, I wasn't ready to be made what I ought to be. <laughs> They'd look, Dan Lee, come on, sing that song. And I'd sing, he's still working on me. Pull a Zoe on. Me and my buddies had reached way down and go, to make me what I ought to be. <laughs> he's been working on me for a long time. I'm stubborn, I'm headstrong, I'm hard-headed. And sometimes I just don't get it. I'm dyslexic. I'm ADHD, I'm ADD, I'm A-B-C-D-E-F-G-H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O-P. Sometimes I don't get it. I was at the doctor this week, and it was that time of the year that they're like vampires, they want your blood. And Brother George come in there and he got in trouble. And I didn't get in any trouble, but I knew he was in trouble the way he walked in. He said, you're here too? I said, yeah, I'm on my own accord. They booked it and I said, you gotta go to the doctor. I can preach that now. I told y'all when I got Medicare, I was going to the doctor. And I hound them to death. I, I make them earn their money. Amen. Sometime I show up without an appointment and want to see them talk to them about something. And they've just become my friends, whether they know it or not. <laughs> and they had these old goofy question things in there I had to answer since I'm on Medicare. And it, it got to that last one. Said, can you subtract threes from seventeen? all the way down to zero. Well, no, you can't do that because you end up with two. So I wrote no on there. Just overthinking it. 
You'd do it too if you was my age. I'm thinking logically, you cannot subtract three from 17 down to zero. It's, got, it's going to end up at two. I was not wrong. Nurse said, why did you check that no? I said, because it's no. Is it a trick question? She said, what is 17 minus 3? 14. What is 14 minus 3? 11. And I said, keep going. <laughs> you're not at zero, you're at two. She said, you're missing it. You should have answered that yes. I said, no. They should have said, can you subtract 17, 3 from 17 down to 2, not 0? It's a typo. <laughs> Looked at me like I was stupid. And I walked out of there and I said, Brother Tom, you know that's exactly what Medicare wants you to feel is like you're stupid. And I started to tell her, be sure and don't show that to my oldest daughter because she'll want to have me declared incompetent. <laughs> and ship me off to a state home somewhere and have me taken care of. But they started naming all kind of shots. Do you want, have you had this shot? No. You want us to give it to you? No. Well, by the time I'd have left there, I'd have had five shots. I wouldn't even made it to your party. I said, I didn't come in here for no shots today. I just came in here because y'all wanted to. The only thing you needed, I'm going to get that needle in my vein. And that vein rolled on me and I almost hit the floor. Never hurt that bad. That nurse got to feeling bad. Well, you should feel bad. Amen. But it's just things you have to do. Aren't you glad you come to church this morning? This is Palm Sunday. They was crying, Hosanna to the great king. That's why I get a little nervous when people pray. But this life, I want to live it in such a way that his death was worth it. When I stand before God, I want every part of my life to be pleasing to God. Every aspect. I want it to please God. Why don't we stand this morning, lift our hands to the Lord today. Come on, let's just lift our hands to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Living a life that's worth your dying, Jesus. Give us desire because desire turns into results. You're our Savior. You're everything. Can we just gather to the front for a moment or so this morning? It's in order. Let's pray over our service next Sunday. Pray that it be the most powerful Easter service that we've had yet. Pray that somebody will get baptized in Jesus' name. That somebody will get filled with the Holy Ghost. Thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God.
remember next Sunday, we could all try to bring somebody to the house of the Lord with us. Bring some children with you. Amen. It's Resurrection Sunday. We're going to celebrate a resurrection of our Savior. Amen. We're going to have a great, great, great time. We're going to need some of you men to, to help with our candy rain and hide these Easter eggs and, and get ready. Thank the Lord. God bless you. Shake hands one with another. Prayer meeting tomorrow night from 6.30 to 7.30 just have a great time in the Lord Wednesday at 7 Amen we had a tremendous move of God here Wednesday night Amen. tremendous move of God God bless you so much